वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम मोहुआ रॉय असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशियोलॉजी फ्रॉम लेडी ब्रिबॉन कॉलेज कोलकाता आई एम डिस्कसिंग अ मॉड्यूल एंटाइटल्ड वीमेंस मूवमेंट इन इंडिया अंडर द पेपर सोशल मूवमेंट द मॉड्यूल इंटेंस टू इंट्रोड्यूस द थ्री फेजेस ऑफ वीमेंस मूवमेंट इन इंडिया ऑब्जर्व द वेरियस चैलेंजेस दैट आर that were posed by the women's movement uh, to the dominant social cultural and political uh, trends of the country and also observe the various uh, issues that were raised at that point and the various achievements and failures of the movement uh, the movement has been classified into three phases mainly three phases the first second and the third phase and an in between phase linking the first and the second phase it is important to note that the classification of the phases is by no means a unilinear evolutionary trail uh, which presupposes an ongoing uh, proliferation or gradual pro proliferation of feminist consciousness and also that uh, one phase is qualitatively superior than the other uh, it is rather based on uh, a contextual chronological and thematic principle coming to the phases now the first phase uh, the early years of the first phase may be contextualized uh, in terms of the entire project of colonization as well as uh, the nationalist discourse uh, in india uh, and hence it was very closely linked to the ideals of nationalism as well as uh, the social reform movement Uh, it is very interesting to note that the women who were involved in the reform movement they demanded civil and political rights under the leadership of the nationalists and uh, it actually led to a unique blend of uh, feminism and nationalism the key issues that were addressed during this period mainly revolved around uh, uprooting the social evil of sati a uh, prohibition of child marriage sanctioning of widow remarriage and also uh, guaranteeing property rights to women through uh, 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 through uh, legislations and also uh, addressing the uh, issue of education uh, for women apart from uh, the associations like brahmo samaj arya samaj there was a group of women from the reformed elite families who in an effort to create a distinct women's association in an effort to unify uh, the women uh, irrespective of caste creed as well as race class uh, created uh, women's organizations uh, with the objective of empowering the women uh, morally as well as materially and such organizations include the lady society uh, which was formed in 1882 by shorno kumari devi sharda sadan in bombay as well as arya mahila samaj in pune also in 1882 by ramabai saraswati and uh, 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 in 1910 we have uh, shorola devi choudhurani creating the bharat stree mahamandal now all these women's organizations were or were founded with the objective of having a women's exclusive platform because till then all women's meetings were also uh, be uh, being, uh, were held in conjunction with the meetings of the national social congress so in order to have a platform of their own uh, such organizations were founded the interwar years from 1917 to 1945 witness the women's movement deal with very two significant issues uh, and that took quite successfully uh, that is the women's uh, right to vote from 1917 to 1927 and also uh, the reform Uh, of personal laws from 1927 to 29 uh, with regards to the uh, voting rights for women we find that uh, travancore and cochin uh, were the first to offer women the rights to vote in 1920 and it was soon followed by bombay and madras in 1921 conferring similar rights to women it was only in 1926 
that we find in Bengal women were allowed to vote and that to property women. Now, uh, it is also uh, in this regard, it is also important to note that this entire scenario was possible after a meeting that was held in which uh, Shorojini Naidu uh, along with an all India women's delegation and also Shorola Devi Chaudhurani with her representatives of uh, Bharat's three Mahamandal met Montague and Chelmsford to appeal for women's suffrage. And however, the sex disqualification could be removed only after a delegation was sent to England uh, to uh, uh, pursue the joint parliamentary committee. 1917 also witnesses the uh, initiation of the, all, the first All India Women's Association uh, which campaigned for voting rights for women and it was initiated with the efforts, uh, sincere efforts from Annie Besant, uh, uh, from Annie Besant, uh, Margaret Cousins and also uh, Dorothy Jinnar Raja Dasa. Now as far as the reform of personal laws were concerned, we find that in 1927 the All India Women's Conference uh, was initiated by uh, Margaret Cousins and with the, with the objective to address the issue of education of women in India. And they soon realized that the issue of education was uh, very much connected to other social issues of parda, uh, child marriage and other social customs. So they felt that uh, you know they should campaign for things like uh, they campaigned for a rise in the age of marriage for women which also led to the passing of the Sharda Act of 1929 in which we find that women the age of marriage for women were fi was fixed at uh, 14 and for men at 18 but later on again it got revised uh, to 18 for girls and 21 for men. The All India Women's Conference also uh, campaigned uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, reform of personal laws, but they soon met with resistance as far as a common civil law was concerned. So they thought of, uh, uh, so they thought of um, campaigning for reform uh, in Hindu personal law. Uh, which actually you know uh, dealt with prohibition of uh, polygamy for instance and uh, also uh, uh, advocating for uh, divorce rights for women and also property rights for women so all the relentless campaign for such reform finally led to the passing of the Hindu court bill uh, in 1950 which was a series of laws which was passed to reform the Hindu laws it is true that women uh, had participated uh, in large numbers uh, during the Swadeshi movement as well as the Home Rule movement between 1905 and 1911. But it is an undoubted fact that uh, women actually participated in large numbers. They came out from the domestic confines of their home only after the Gandhian call for Satyagraha, Saul Satyagraha, Rural Satyagraha, the Civil Disobedience Movement, uh, the Quit India Movement and so on. And we find that women during this phase, they organize meetings or rallies and uh, women's organizations like the uh, uh, Nari Satyagraha Samiti, the uh, Mahila Rashtriya Sangh, they organized mass boycotts uh, for foreign goods and products as well as liquor, foreign clothes and liquor. Mainly at this point we find non-violence being the dominant mode of protest. Uh, however, some also resorted to uh, certain revolu revolutionary and uh, terrorist groups. Uh, in this context, we can also talk, we can also say that uh, Shubhash Chandra Bosch, uh, he encouraged the participation of women in the women's uh, regiment in the Azad Hind Forge. Uh, again, undoubtedly, women, in spite of uh, their mass participation, uh, in spite of their exposure from their domestic confines, 
it also raised a number of questions as far as the women's participation in the contradict contradictory realm of the public and the private was concerned. And we find that the nationalists reviewed the question of women's participation in the public realm uh, in, in, in terms of their you know, sustenance of their uh, age old feminine virtues which was based on sexual purity and which could only be retained if they remained at home. So in this context we can say that even though the political practices of both Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Shubhas Chandra Bosch was quite uh, oppositional to each other in most respects, uh, somehow both, uh, uh, both uh, agreed or both kind of they, they had a similar notion about uh, pro, uh, pro, retaining the iconic image and iconic role of women as far as their participation in the national nationalist movement was concerned. So in this regard we can talk about you know two categories of women the married women uh, who, who, who was both a mother and a wife and uh, who could you know render their support uh, in the nationalist movement but by staying from their home front only whereas the other women uh, was the uh, unmarried uh, or the widowed women who had severed their rights uh, or they had, who had severed their familial ties uh, for the nation and they could render a direct uh, support or they could get involved in direct action as far as the nationalist movement was concerned. Uh, over and above, over and all, uh, the first phase of uh, women's movement has often been criticized as being subservient in nature. Uh, nevertheless, we find that it was uh, marked by a massive participation of women uh, by you know, coming out from their domestic confines and for this they had to endure massive criticism, uh, the magnitude and severity of which cannot be accounted for. Uh, it has often been said that somewhere in the first phase, the country's independence and the independence of the country and independence of women has, been in, has got intertwined. But it is also true that at some major points it does overlap but at other points it do oppose each other. Now as far as the uh, post-independence period is concerned, it is a very important phase because it kind of links the first and the second phase of women's movement. Uh, and we find that in the post-independence period the cause for women remain an issue of concern. Even though there are certain uh, efforts which are made like there was the principle of uh, gender equality introduced uh, through the uh, fundamental rights resolution which was passed in 1936 and which um, actually which was later uh, kind of transformed into a constitutional measure uh, guaranteeing equality of the sexes in article 14 and 16. Uh, and also we find that various administrative bodies were uh, established to provide opportunity for women. Nevertheless, uh, in the mid 1960s, we find, uh, find widespread discontent among the people, especially among the youth and the working class. And this actually led to peasant movements. It led to the anti-price agitations in Kolkata, Bombay and Gujarat. Now in the late 70s, 1970s, we find a number of uh, movements uh, in the radical left as well as in the socialist front which has important implications for the growth of women's organizations during this phase and one such movement is the Nokshalbari uh, movement which was which, which, which was started in uh, West Bengal and later spread to Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar and Punjab and uh, gradually we find the women's organizations coming up like 
শ্রমিক সংগঠন ফাইনালি লিডিং টু দ্য শাহাদা মুভমেন্ট অফ দ্য নাইনটিন দেন উই হ্যাভ দি দি সেলফ এমপ্লয়েড উইমেন্স অ্যাসোসিয়েশন সেবা by Ila Bhatt in 1972 finally leading to the trade union movement of 1972 and we also have the anti price rise agitations which was launched by the students in Gujarat and which was uh, joined uh, by the middle class uh, women in massive numbers and which later you know turned into the Nav Nirman movement of 1974 we also have the Sampurna Kranti movement of the of 1974 uh, which was uh, uh, which was led by jay prakash narayan and uh, in this in this period of 1973-74 we also find mrinal gore from the socialist party and many other women from the all india communist party uh, coming together and forming the united women's anti price rise committee seeking to protect the consumers uh, along with that we also have the progressive organization of women who also instigated uh, criticism of the radical left apart from all the other all the all these movements of 1973-74 we also have the chipko movement of 1973-74 which is very important because it is one of the first uh environmental movement non violent environmental movement uh which was started uh against uh commercial logging in himalayas and which actually symbolized a deep connection between women and nature eco feminists like vandana shiva they criticize modern science and technology as being western uh patriarchal and uh, colonial in their project because they they exploit women and nature alike and it is because of this that they feel that pursuing such a course of development is is like you know shifting from the traditional philosophy traditional indian philosophy which considers nature that is prakriti as the ultimate feminine principle from which life emanates so the post independence phase uh again is not without its problems and the first and foremost the the problem that can be pointed out is the fact that in the post independence phase there has been a shift uh as far as the uh, attention or attention of women is concerned and unlike the first phase where mostly the middle class upper middle class women were they were the prime object of attention in the post independence phase we find the the, the attention shifts to the to the poor women and even though attention was paid to the poor women the urban and the rural working class women uh somehow it was felt that the the people could not uh identify uh with their problems their problems could not be identified and even though various efforts were being made to bring a bring an improvement to their situation uh most of the efforts were welfare in their origin and not truly empowering them so this was the first problem the second problem was uh, it was felt that there was a relative lull in the course of women's movement in the post independence phase and it was because perhaps because uh, there was no more a common enemy to fight against and secondly uh, the women's issue or uh, to be more specific gender discrimination as an issue was not still being viewed as a separate issue uh separate from the uh social and political issues now the gravity of the various women's organizations in the first phase as well as uh, the uh real situation of the women 
could only be gauged uh, with the publication of the Towards Equality Report in 1974. Uh, now, in 1975, the United Nations organized the World Conference of Women in Mexico and uh, also declared uh, 1975 to 85 as the International Decade for Women. Now, as a part of the World Plan of Action, uh, the National Committee for the Status of Women was formed and uh, they actually uh, published and presented uh, the report on uh, the status of women in the country uh, in 1974 and this actually uh, reflected or it represented the abysmal situation of women with regards to one uh, the decreasing sex ratio to the increase in infant mortality and morb morbidity and uh, the economic marginalization of women and finally the discriminatory and uh, personal laws with its evil effects. Uh, the, uh, uh, the National Committee for the Status of Women had also uh, come up with its solutions and in, in this regard and they had you know they had talked about eradication of dowry uh, polygamy bigamy and child marriage uh, they had proposed various provisions like provision for creches uh, for children uh, maternity benefits for women uh, good working conditions and also equal pay for equal work and also legal enactments in relation to divorce uh, maintenance, inheritance, adoption and also try to advocate for the universalization of education for women. However, we find that the report does not talk much about violence against women, uh, experience of violence that uh, women has in civil society as well as violence inflicted by uh, those in uh, custody. Uh, uh, and also in, uh, those uh, in case of uh, custodial uh, violence. However, the report received a good response from the government and the media as well as uh, various uh, agencies like the ICSSR, they actually came up with uh, funds uh, for, you know, advocating for uh, and promoting research on various issues related to women. Apart from that, we find that the Towards Equality Report created a new rational and moral basis for the emergence of autonomous women's organizations in women. And it, uh, it kind of ushered in a new phase of women's movement in India. And the autonomous uh, women's organizations, unlike the affiliated organizations, uh, very much different from the structural mandate of the affiliated organizations. They dealt with only women's issues. They did not uh, forget about the various multi-dimensional uh, basis of uh, discrimination with regards to caste, class, creed. And also they did not conceptually subordinate the women's causes to other causes for that matter. And the autonomous women's organization were mainly led by the middle class educated women who sincerely, uh, you know, they, they worked towards the cause of sisterhood, facilitating the other women to speak and also sometimes speaking on their behalf. So the autonomous uh, women's organizations at this phase mainly addressed violence against women and sexual oppression of women in society as well as the overtly patriarchal nature of society and the various uh, issues that they addressed with regards to violence against women was related to rape dowry deaths bride burning and also uh, sexual harassment at workplace uh, honor killings sati etc so over and all we can say that the second phase was successful in arousing the required uh, the, the the feminist uh, consciousness among women and also the various agitations uh, led to a number of um, uh, enactments 
of the 1980s. Now, such enactments were related mainly to the amendment of uh, rape laws in 1983, which was, uh, which was ushered in by widespread discontent due to uh, the uh, Supreme Court judgment regarding uh, acquitting two policemen of charges of rape uh, in case of a minor tribal girl called Mathura, even though the High Court had actually convicted uh, both the policemen. Uh, and this actually led to, you know, massive agitations throughout the country from the autonomous women's organizations like Vimochana, Saheli, uh, Progressive Organization for uh, Women and Forum Against the Operation of Women in Bombay. So they launched widespread uh, campaign against uh, such an injustice and they actually thought they were actually trying to redefine the issue of consent with regard to rape cases along with that we have the dowry prohibition act of 1961 uh, getting revised in 1984 and 86 because the uh, definition of dowry was very vague uh, initially so in order to uh, in order to uh, uh, modify uh, and have a comprehensive definition of dowry it was amended in 1984 and 86 along with that we have the 1971 uh, medical termination and pregnancy act uh, for safe scientific uh, abortion but it again got uh, associated with female feticide and for that agitations against female feticide uh, there was a central legislation for banning the prenatal sex selection uh, tests uh, so that it cannot facilitate uh, female feticide uh, now such laws passing of such laws uh, again had was problematic because the laws ultimately kind of retained the patriarchal structure and uh, it, it did not really identify the women's problem, uh, the problems that women faced and uh, the, the, the failure of the laws uh, could mainly be attributed to the fact that they were they were given as a token rather than for a real concern for women. So even the activists uh, without uh, gauging the co causes and consequences of these laws often had to accept them as measures of empowerment for women. Now it was soon realized that only passing of laws, implementing the laws uh, without uh, true consciousness among women and education uh, will not be fruitful. So there was a need for legal literacy of women and also educating women, gender sensitization of media as well as textbook was required. And it was with this aim in mind and along with the government initiatives, the discipline of women's studies was initiated. And unlike the other uh, social sciences. Women's studies is definitely a, a value loaded uh, discipline because it strives to uh, understand the problems of women in society. Uh, Vina Majumdar has truly uh, said that the women's studies uh, discipline is like an academic arm of the women's movement which can actually transform uh, women's perspective about themselves and also transform how people view women in society. So at that time uh, there was not much of uh, women's studies centers but uh, uh, two of them uh, like uh, two of the uh, very important women uh, studies research centers was in one in uh, SNDT Women's University in Bombay and another one in uh, the Tata Institute of uh, Social Sciences is this also in Mumbai. But over the years there has been a proliferation of uh, women's studies centers and initiatives throughout the country who uh, and uh, agent and there has been various uh, funding agencies uh, sponsoring research initiatives as far as women issues are concerned. The third phase witnesses uh, the continued legal battle for enactments uh, for women uh, and it was perhaps because 
the issues that were raised in the 1970s and 1980s uh, could not still be resolved. So this actually led to again a number of enactments at this phase. Uh, the 30 year struggle leading to uh, the protection of women from Domestic Violence Act 2005 and uh, the preconception and prenatal diagnostic technique act of 2002 and the sexual harassment uh, at workplace act uh, prevention uh, prohibition and redressal uh, to uh, act of 2013 apart from this we find that the 73rd and the 74th amendment uh, constitutional amendment uh, actually uh, reserves 33 percent seat for women in the uh, panchayat and nagar palika bodies and this actually is very significant because it actually gives women the opportunity to participate in the decision making in local uh, decision making bodies and as well as in governance. But nevertheless, the problem still lies with the 81st Constitutional Amendment Bill of 1996, which actually uh, seeks to reserve uh, one third seat for women in the parliament, but which has unfortunately been uh, have which, which unfor unfortunately have received much resistance from various corners of the society. Apart from this, it is a very important to mention uh, one of the very important issues that has been raised during this time and it has been the issue of caste and the National F uh, Federation of Dalit Women uh, which was established in 1995 have actually uh, you know some, some they have forced the activists to view the uh, dimension of caste uh, because it was felt that the agenda of the women's movement have have always been from the perspective of the upper class and upper and middle caste women which often uh, kind of uh, marginalizes and uh, effaces the, the identity of the Dalit women and the, the, the Dalit women have actually uh, you know they have uh, pointed out to the threefold uh, nature of oppression of women in society Dalit women in society and that is from the upper caste upper class and from the Dalit men uh, themselves. So uh, eminent social scholars like uh, um, Gopal Guru and uh, Sharmila Rege, they have, uh, uh, they have advocated for a Dalit standpoint which actually talks about the differently uh, 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 the differently situated they talks about the experiences of the differently situated dalit women in society where their problems are markedly different from those of the men as well as uh, the non dalit women in society uh, Another very important movement of the 1990s and of the third phase has been the LGBT movement and it has actually carved out a space, a platform for the political expression of the uh, non-normative uh, sexualities. It talks about the rights of the same-sex people as well as the hijras and the kotis. And so it has actually given the uh, non-normative sexualities uh, a platform to voice their opinion and problems. Uh, finally, to conclude, we can say that the three phases they, they represent on the one hand uh, exclusion, violence against women, oppression, but that is also seen to be countered by excessive resistance from the women's movement. And even though it is sometimes felt that the multiple issues, uh, the multiple situations with regards to the dimensions of caste, class, creed, race, language has led to multiple and contending voices which somehow appears to you know reduce the unity, the solidarity uh, of the women's movement that was a marked feature of the first and the second phase. Uh, but nevertheless, this is, this, this is not a point of contention, this is not a point of concern uh, and something to be apprehensive about. Because often such uh, multiple 
consciousness, uh, often such multiple uh, voices represents uh, a maturity, it represents different levels of consciousness uh, which might be constitutive for a nuanced uh, political women's movement in the country. Thank you.